Thank you. Great to be with you again this morning. And thank you so much again for the invitation to be with you. You have given me such a warm welcome to this beautiful campus. Thank you. Um, yesterday, I spoke a little bit about how rarely most of us Reformed folks think or talk about things eschatological. Um, and one of the big reasons for that is the topic that I'm going to say a little bit about this morning. It is the big future event that will usher in everything else about the eschaton. It's the return of Christ. Um, the New Testament, right, is absolutely saturated in this hope. From the earliest times, before even the New Testament as we have it got written down, ordinary Christians were crying out, Maranatha, come Lord, come. Now, there's some dispute amongst the biblical scholars about whether that really is an eschatological prayer or not, but I'm siding with the scholars who say that it is. And you know that something goes way, way back to the very earliest days of the Christian community when um, in our Greek New Testament, right, the New Testament originally written in Greek, when you have in the Greek New Testament an Aramaic word, and Maranatha is Aramaic. So this is really, really early, this longing for the Lord to return. The hope of Christ's return is a major theme across the board in the early centuries of the church, and the Nicene Creed sums it up this way. It says that, the, that Jesus will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And then now, I mean right now, as your own statement puts it wonderfully, whoop, there we are, puts it wonderfully, we believe that the Lord Jesus will return bodily, visibly, to judge all mankind and to receive his people to himself. And maybe if you attend a fairly liturgical church, right, when you're celebrating the Lord's Supper, you might say these words before you go, before you receive. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Here's the thing, though. Perhaps your experience of Reformed churches is different to mine, but I wonder when was the last time you heard any preaching or teaching on this? Maybe a little bit of a mention in Advent, but likely not much more than that. There are all sorts of reasons for the silence. I mean, perhaps quietly, some of us do wonder in our hearts if it's really going to happen. I mean, it's been a long, long time and it hasn't happened yet. Or maybe it's something that we believe, but we really have no idea how to talk about it, and so we just stay quiet. A lot of it, though, I suspect, is also because we don't want to be lumped in with the folks who seem to talk about absolutely nothing else. You know what I mean? The ones who spend their lives trying to correlate various events in the world with an end times timetable. And you talk about being rapture ready and saying you don't want to be left behind, do you? And those who confidently set dates for Jesus' time to come back and then revise them until they die and thereby turn off any number of people from actually hearing the gospel. So given all of that, I can kind of understand why we Reformed folks do not talk much about the return of Jesus. But like I say, it's a big deal in Scripture. And if we don't teach and preach about it, well, people are going to have a go at filling in the blanks for themselves. And that usually means pop culture versions of eschatology that folks get from films and books and things that are kind of seriously scripturally questionable. I don't know about you, but sadly, I know a number of cradle reform folks, right? People born into the reform tradition who've got most of their eschatology from the Left Behind series because, well, no one else ever talked about it. And so, you know, we'll fill in the blanks for ourselves. And I also know a number of cradle reform folks who sense that some of this stuff is absolutely scripturally off the wall, but they don't really know how to have a serious conversation about it, so they just stay quiet when their dispensationalist friends start explaining everything and asking them, are you rapture ready? And you don't want to be left behind, do you? And this is not good, folks. It really is not good at all. So what do we say about the return of Christ? Well, as the really wonderful theology prof who first taught me about eschatology said, there are two basic problems here. One is saying far, far, far too much, and the other one is saying far, far, far too little. I'm going to take that second one first. Uh, let's just acknowledge it straight out, right? The idea of Christ's return is difficult to get our heads around in all sorts of ways, and there are some folks who would simply rather not do that. So what do you do with all those scriptures that eagerly anticipate Jesus is coming again? Well, you say, he's not actually physically going to come again. He comes to us again every time we read the Bible or hear the word preached. Then we encounter Jesus that way. 
or for others. He comes again every time we receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Or he comes again in my heart when I pray. Now, all of those things are true in a way. It is true that by the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is indeed present to us in the reading and the preaching of the word as we receive the supper and as we pray. But the New Testament is also pretty clear that these are not at all the same thing, right? That way of Jesus being present and Jesus coming again in glory, not the same thing. So that's the kind of way of saying far, far, far too little. If we are going to hold fast to what the scriptures have to say, we are going to have to say a lot more than that. We have to say things like he's coming back once, visibly, bodily, publicly, in glory. When Jesus returns right, it will not be quietly in your heart. The scriptures are clear about that. When the Maranatha prayer is finally answered, Jesus' return will be visible, like when lightning lights up the whole sky. It is going to be public. No one is going to miss this. Every eye will see it. And it will be in glory. Um, the first time that Jesus came, it was in humility, sort of incognito, right? Uh, it was not immediately obvious to everyone that in Jesus, God himself had come amongst us, but not this next time. And it will be physical. Just as he ascended in his glorified humanity, so Jesus will return with it. And that picks up on one of the themes from yesterday. Bodies belong in the eschatological new creation. When Jesus returns to usher in the fullness of the new creation, it will be in the fullness of who he is. So, whether we like it or not, whether we're comfortable with it or not, this is the sort of thing that we can say on the basis of the scriptural witness, and we have to say it, right? Uh, we must never say less than this sort of thing. It blows our minds, and so it should, right? Um, if you ask me, how can everyone in the world experience this at the same time, and all the other how questions that go along with this kind of event that the New Testament says it's going to be, my answer is, I have no idea, right? But thank God, that is for God to deal with, and not me. This is hard. Because we sort of say, oh, okay, I guess I believe this. It's a mystery, but I believe it. Even so, let's be honest, it does not seem to make much sense. A bit like one more impossible thing you're supposed to believe as a Christian before breakfast. Bear with me, though, because there is going to be more that we can say, and it's going to make a whole lot of pieces fall into place, and it makes us go, yeah, aha, of course. Now I see why Jesus has to come back, but I'll get to that right towards the end. Right now, though, I want to say a little bit about that other problem I mentioned. We've had the problem of saying far, far, far too little about the return of Christ. And then there's the problem of trying to say far, far, far too much. How do we do that? Oh, all sorts of ways. Um, here's one of them, the timetabling thing. I was teaching an eschatology class back in the spring semester of 2011 when a guy called Howard Camping gave me and my class an absolute gift, right? He predicted that the rapture was going to happen on the 21st of May that year. Now, um, my students had an uproariously good time with this because finals were scheduled for the week before that. So you can imagine all the kinds of things. Prof, do I really need to study for my finals? Prof, is there anything we can do to bring the date of Jesus' of return forward a week? And I had another really good one. One of my students was, was going to get married in June and he's saying, hey, Prof, should we bring the wedding forward? Um, you get the idea, right? We were having an uproariously good time laughing about this, but we also had all sorts of very good, very interesting and quite serious theological conversations around it as well. And of course it did not happen and Howard Camping pushed the rapture date forward to October the 21st and of course it didn't happen then either. And then he had to acknowledge that he'd been wrong to try to predict the date because well Jesus did say not to do that sort of thing. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, this is one of the biggest ways, right, that so many folks have tried to say far, 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 far too much about the return of Jesus. I and mean, it is not only unscriptural, camping is right, yeah, for goodness sake, you've got Jesus himself telling you, do not do this. It's one of the simplest instructions Jesus, Jesus gave to his followers, just don't do it, right? Um, attempts at date fixing, but the trouble is, this brings the whole gospel into utter disrepute, and it makes it so much harder to witness to people um, outside of the faith when their idea of what the faith is is some guy predicting the date when Jesus is going to return. 
But it's not just Howard Camping, right? Loads of people have done this down the centuries. If not try to pinpoint the actual specific date, at least to attempt to second guess like political events and natural disasters as the beginning of the end. Oh, and I discovered just recently, by the way, that it's not just the doom and gloom stuff. Normally, when people try the timetabling for Jesus' return, it's like disasters and, and horrible things. But right now, in the Midwest, there are plenty of folks who, not entirely tongue-in-cheek, are wondering about whether the Cubs uh, making it to the World Series is a sort of a sign of the imminent return of Jesus. Um, no comment. Other ways of saying too much. Trying to say that the scriptures give a detailed kind of coded, you know, Da Vinci Code, coded blueprint of how the end times will unfold. No, they don't. Scripture has a lot to say about the fullness of the coming kingdom of God and how to live now in the light of what's coming um, and even how to interpret, as Jesus says, the signs of the times. But no matter what anyone tries to tell you about number codes and symbols in the book of Daniel and Revelation, for example, these books are not in our Bibles to give us God's secret code for calculating the identity of the Antichrist and scheduling the end times. Uh, I'm sure you know all of this, and I'm going to leave it to your Bible profs to explain to you in more detail about this stuff and give you really good resources for um, reflecting on, on those books and understanding them well, and there are plenty of good things out there. So there's picking the date, there's kind of more general timetabling for the end, um, and then, of course, one more way of saying too much about the return of Jesus. going to spend quite a bit of time on this one. There's always the whole rapture thing. Um... The classic understanding of the rapture says, among other things, that Jesus is going to come back invisibly first time and just halfway down, okay, invisibly halfway down, and he's going to whisk the true believers off up into heaven, uh, off in the air, up into heaven for seven years, while everybody else experiences seven years of hell on earth during the tribulation. And then, after those seven years are up, Jesus is going to come back another time. So I guess you could say the third coming here. He's going to come back another time, all the way down, visibly in glory, for the battle of Armageddon and the defeat of the armies of the Antichrist. Remember just a few moments ago, I said that there are some things we can say about the return of Jesus from Scripture, and I said he's going to return once, visibly, in glory. Well, we need to say that not only because there are some folks who aren't comfortable with saying that Jesus is going to come back at all, we need to say that because the rapture folks say he'll come back twice more, once invisibly, part way down, to whisk the tree believers up, and then another time in glory, all the way down. Just no, people, no. Um, there's actually a whole load more going on in this whole dispensationalist sort of framework too. If, if you want the full name, it's the premillennial dispensationalists or sometimes also the dispensational premillennialists. Um, and they're the ones, they are the only ones who believe that this rapture thing is going to happen. And there's a whole lot more, as I say, that goes into their eschatological beliefs as well. Don't have time to go there this morning. But for most people, the details, right, the details don't matter. It's the rapture thing that has captured the popular imagination to such an extent that non-Christians simply take it for granted that this is what all Christians believe. I remember a few years back, a movie came out. It wasn't a Christian film. It was just a regular sci-fi movie, a uh, mainstream kind of doomsday flick. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm not into movies much, so I can't remember the title. But anyway, this totally non-Christian end of the world kind of movie included a rapture scene. And someone in the movie says something like, oh, look, it really must be the end of the world. That thing the Christians are talking about is happening. Look, off they go. Um, the idea of the rapture has been identified as the distinctive Christian eschatological doctrine, right? Um, it's become the supposedly the default Christian view of what happens at the beginning of the end and the return of Jesus and all that. Um, so it has entered the popular, popular imagination as one of the biggest events of Christian eschatology, but... The rapture, as it's depicted in that way of thinking, isn't actually biblical, and it isn't going to happen. Um, this isn't how Jesus is going to come back. One of my elders back in my, my church in Australia had a really great way of putting this. Um, he wasn't sure what he did believe, to be honest, about the return of Jesus and all of this, but he was pretty sure about what wasn't biblical, and he said something like this, well, if I find myself floating upwards, I guess I'm not going to hold on to the table as I go, um, but it isn't going to happen, is it? Nope, Bill, that was his name, nope. 
It isn't going to happen. But oh, yes, it is, say any number of folks, including a good number of our Christian brothers and sisters. It's in the Bible. Oh, no, it isn't. And no one even dreamt of concocting the rapture from the Bible in the way that it's understood. Jesus comes halfway down, whisks people off, back up to heaven and so on. Um, No one actually thought of that until the 19th century. Now, that sounds like a really long time ago to us, right? Back in the 1800s, that's eons ago. In the history of Christian thought, that is yesterday. So, In all the millennia of reading the Bible, no one dreamed up the idea of the rapture until the equivalent of yesterday. Now, while it's always good to be alert to the Holy Spirit opening up the scriptures in new ways to us, it's also a really good idea to ask some very pointed questions when all of a sudden a brand new interpretation and something that kind of seems out of sync with the majority witness of the scripture just pops up. The big rapture text is 1 Thessalonians 4. And I'm actually going to spend some time with it because it says a whole lot about how the return of Jesus is going to happen. Just not necessarily what some of the rapture folks think. So here's what it says. Um, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. This is Paul, obviously. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who've died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpets, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And boom, you might say back to me, there it is, there's the rapture in black and white, there in the Bible. And along with the rest of the Reformed tradition and the rest of the Christian tradition down the centuries too, for that matter, I'll tell you, um, no, no it isn't. But this is an absolutely wonderful text that tells you in a nutshell almost everything you need to know about the return of Jesus once visibly in glory to usher in the new heavens and the new earth. And here's why. First, Paul's reassuring the Thessalonian Christians that those who've died are not going to miss out, right, when Jesus comes back. That's their big question. That's the real pastoral issue for them. So he says, no, it's okay. Uh, They won't miss out. And then he goes on to describe how all of us will be caught up to meet Jesus. Um, and that, it, you know, that caught up thing is the rapture language. The Latin version of the Greek word there is the verb rapturo. So you can see, oh yeah, rapture, rapture. But that's not the most important word here. The most important word um, is the meet word. We'll be caught up to meet Jesus. For those of you who might be geeky about Greek, Um, The Greek word here is really important. The Greek word for meat comes from the apantasis word group. You don't need to remember that, but what you do need to remember is this is not just any old meat word. It has a very specific meaning. It's the word you use for when a visiting dignitary comes and you go out, you send a delegation of folks out to meet that dignitary in order to escort him or her back to where you came from. So, just say the president came to visit, and I don't mind at this point what your views about the current president um, may be, just say the president comes to visit. Well, chances are you are going to send a delegation of folks to meet him at the airport. Great. The last thing that anyone would expect is the delegation and the president get back on the plane and fly back to where the president came from, okay? That is not how these sorts of things happen. If you go do the apantasis thing to meet the visiting dignitary, it's to escort him back to your place. So the delegation would go, they'd meet the president, then they'd turn around and you'd escort the president all the way back here. That's what you use that apantasis word for. And in case we had any lingering questions about that, that's exactly how the rest of the New Testament uses that word on the other occasions when it comes up. Here are a couple of cool examples. Um, You know the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, right? Um, And we're now at the point where the foolish virgins, they've run off to try to find oil in the city because they have run out. And in the meanwhile, along comes the bridegroom. So what do the wise virgins do? They go out to meet him. Yes, it's that apantasis thing. 
And do they go out to meet him to go back to wherever he came from? No, they go out to meet him, to escort him into the house, and then the doors are locked and the poor foolish virgins are left outside. One more really cool one. End of Acts. Paul is on his way to Rome and indeed to his death. But Paul finds himself now, last chapter of Acts, on the outskirts of Rome, and the Christians who are in Rome get to hear, oh man, Paul's coming, he's on his way. So what do they do? They go out to meet him. Apantasis word again. And then they escort him with them back to Rome. You see where I'm going with this, don't you? And more to the point, do you see where those who rise to meet Christ in the air in Thessalonians are not going? They are not going to be whisked back up to heaven where Jesus came from for seven years. They are going to meet Jesus, to accompany Jesus back down to earth because what Paul is describing here is when Jesus comes again in glory um, with the trumpets, with the archangels, with the cry of command. Yeah, don't ask me where the kind of rapture-believing crowd get the idea that he's coming back invisibly and like no one's going to know because that sure is not what Paul is describing here. There are trumpets, there are archangels, it's all happening, people. Um, and that's because Paul is describing uh, the fullness of the eschaton, folks, when everything happens. The Lord returns, there's a general resurrection, there's a judgment, there's the elimination of evil and sin and causes of sin, and then God will dwell with his people forever, just like it says in Revelation 21. The rapture, as left behind and so on describe it, it's not going to happen. It simply isn't scriptural for even more reasons than I can set out here, but you get the idea it's not going to be that Jesus is going to return once invisibly to whisk true believers away for seven years to avoid the tribulation, then really come back visibly properly the next time to sort everything out. Oh, and by the way, uh, sort of a bit of bad news here, folks. Jesus is very clear that whatever rough stuff happens before he comes, whatever the tribulation is going to be, believers do not get a pass. Okay? They will not escape from it. They will have to go through it just like everybody else. Oh, Jesus will come back. The scriptures are clear about that. He will come back once, visibly, in glory. There are different interpretations of exactly what happens next and when, but that's it. And sorry, folks, you can't actually write a 12-book series on that, and you can't really make films about it. Jesus comes back once in glory. Everything happens. Um, but that's what the scriptures give us. That really is it. So why don't we talk about this, right? Why do we simply let this rapture idea permeate our culture largely unopposed? And it isn't just that it won't happen in the way that this kind of view says it will, it's also the whole rest of an eschatological package that fosters the kind of escapism and dualism that I mentioned yesterday. Jesus comes to save my soul and get me away from this horrible rotten earth uh, and all sorts of other things that go along with that. Um, the reformed tradition along with the rest of, of the Christian tradition just unequivocally rejects that sort of thing. But one reason why we don't tend to talk about such things gets us back to something I mentioned earlier. We don't talk about this because we see the idea of Jesus returning as a mystery, like a really difficult mystery, that doesn't seem to make much sense. So we kind of accept we need to believe it, but we'd rather not think about it or talk about it too much right now. It is indeed a mystery but it makes a whole lot of sense. If we see eschatology as the scriptures intend us to see it, not as a bunch of isolated, somewhat crazy and scary sounding events way off into the future, but as the end of the story of which we are in the middle. Eschatology, the return of Jesus and so on, is the end of the story of which we are in the middle. Eschatology is not about some bolt-on events at the end of time and space and history as we know it that have nothing to do with anything that has come before. Like I said yesterday, eschatology is all about the culmination, the fulfillment of all of God's promises and purposes from the beginning. It's the end of the story of which we are in the middle. And you know this story well, well, right? But let me tell it to you again, briefly, in a way that might help you to see that there is no more fitting and no more obvious way for this story to culminate than the return of Jesus being at the very heart of it. So the story begins with the triune God who is perfect love within himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he chooses to turn that love outward and to create. You could say that God loved the entire of creation into being. Right at the heart of the triune God's creating act is the Son, the Word through whom all things were made, the one uh, in whom all things hold together. 
Just as the son was there in the beginning of the story of God's good creation, so the son is the one who comes into the midst when all things have been darkened and smeared by our sin. The eternal son enters into his creation in the incarnation, ministry, death, resurrection and ascension. The word made flesh is at the centre of the redeeming and the reconciling of all things. So, He's there in the beginning of the story at creation. He enters into creation in the middle of the story. Of course he's going to be front and centre at the end of this entire story when all of God's promises and purposes find their consummation. He is the one, as Paul says, in whom all of the promises of God find their yes and amen. I'll say it again, the eschaton is the end of the story of which we're in the middle. The return of Christ in glory, right? The return of Christ in glory makes much, much more sense when you see that, of course, he's going to be front and centre at the end of the entire story because he has been front and centre from the very, very beginning. This is the end of the long story of God's dealings with his creation that he has loved into being, the people he's called to be his own, And just as the sun has been at the centre from the beginning, so it makes all the sense in the world that he will be at the very heart of things at the end. And while we wait for the time when he will return in glory to make all things new, we also commit ourselves to walk by the Spirit in ways that reflect our hope for the glorious consummation of this story, the coming of the kingdom of holiness and love and righteousness and justice and the whole creation rejoicing to be set free from the burdens our sin has placed upon it. And as we seek to do that, so we join all of the disciples from the very earliest of days to continue to pray, come, Lord Jesus, pray with me. Lord Jesus, come. We don't even fully know what we mean when we say this because it blows our minds to pieces to try to think about all those how questions. How will you come back? How will everyone see you and know you? So many more. But it's right that something like this should be more than our tiny minds can handle. What we cling to is that you, Lord Jesus, are at the heart of everything from the beginning of creation to the new creation. And what we cling to are the promises that you will come again in glory. And when you do, all things will be made new. Thank you for who you are, for what you've done, what you are doing, what you will do. And help us to walk in your ways until you come. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing to close out. Praise God from Christmas.